Hi everyone and welcome to this Institution of Chemical Engineers Water Special Interest Group and International Water Association Masterclass, uh, which is a panel discussion today. Just briefly, the, the ICME is a professional membership organisation for chemical, biochemical and process engineers with a membership of around 40,000 members in about 100 countries. And the Water Special Interest Group um, is one of about 20 special interest groups, um, which is run by a committee of volunteers and aims to um, share knowledge and share experience in water and wastewater treatment. My name's Amanda Lake and I'm, I've got the pleasure of being your moderator today. So I'm a member of the Institution of Chemical Engineers Water Special Interest Group and also of the International Water Association and, and their sub, uh, subgroup on greenhouse gas emissions. In addition to my day job, um, which is as a process engineer with Jacobs um, based here in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, I'm really passionate about supporting climate action in the water sector and, um, and do feel that we've got an ethical obligation to do this to our profession and, and to our children and, and to future generations. And so we're, um, we're here today at our event called Climate Action Now. And um, this is a fourth event in the masterclass series on process emissions, which we've held over the past five months. And it was, it was um, really to coincide with the release of the you know, International Water Association's book, Quantification and Modeling of Fugitive Greenhouse Gases from Gas Emissions from the Urban, from urban Water Systems. Um, and really happy here to have two of the editors um, of that book, Liu and Jose, on the panel today. It's a really great open access textbook on process emissions and really the first of its kind, published by Iowa. Um, and it's contributed, it's been contributed to by some of the, the leading researchers and practitioners in who are working on process emissions. I had the pleasure of, of um, contributing just a very small amount to one of the chapters. And, and when I read the rest of the book, I realized that um, you know, it's such valuable knowledge that we really needed to get information out there and um, was fortunate that Liu and Jose were happy to come together and support this, um, organizing this masterclass series to really um, talk about the theory and the practice and opportunities and challenges. And, and that's really why we're here today. Um, you'll find all of the, we've had three previous masterclasses, um, a general one, which gives an overview of the topic and the book, um, a, a deep dive on nitrous oxide and one on methane. And then um, to complement the, the kind of the great technical coverage in the book, we've really tried to make the masterclasses um, full of on the ground practice in, in utilities and practitioners who are actually taking action. Um, and today we, we, we go back to the topic of nitrous oxide and we've got a really great panel um, who I'll, in, I'll ask to introduce themselves shortly. Um, but yeah, it, it's really great to have this group um, share and initially I'll ask them to share a little bit about themselves and the work that they're doing um, and perhaps where they're dialing in from today because we really do have a global a global panel of experts. And then um, we'll go back and briefly um, talk through some questions that we, we would like to discuss today, um, but actually the opportunity is there for everyone on the call to raise their own questions. So um, please, please do this in the, in the um, questions box, which you should see on the GoToWebinar panel. Um, and just briefly on housekeeping, um, everyone will be, all the attendee microphones will be muted. We will have a one and, one and a half hour discussion today. So we'll talk through those questions and hopefully it will be a really interesting, engaging discussion. Um, please raise your questions in the questions box. And I would also just remind everyone that the session is being recorded and it will be available um, to everyone online after the event. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to um, go to each of the panelists and just ask them to spend a minute or two introducing themselves, um, where they're dialing in from and, and what their link is with uh, working on nitrous oxide. Um, so I think I will start with Liu, if that's okay. Thanks, Liu. Yeah. Hello everyone, thanks for the um, very nice introduction, Amanda. So you give a very good overview about the overall um, the masterclass and also the book. Uh, so my name is Liu Ye. Um, I'm currently dating from Brisbane, Australia. So it's uh, eight o'clock uh, in my time. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Queensland. So Amanda mentioned that uh, I'm uh, one of the editors of the book. So my research focused on the fugitive greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the urban water uh, system. So I start to work uh, on the nitrous oxide emission uh, back to 2010. So I've been working with um, uh, all the major, um, a lot of major Australian water utilities to quantify, uh, to model and also mitigate nitrous oxide emissions uh, from the treatment plant here. And also, um, uh, I'm also doing fundamental studies, uh, look at 
fundamentally how microorganisms uh, produce nitrous oxide uh, under different conditions uh, and how we can use uh, molecular tools and also uh, modeling tools to understand these emissions. So hopefully that uh, in today's session, uh, I can share more about what we have done in Australia and also some of my perspectives uh, in about in the future, how we can better quantify and mitigate nitrous oxide emissions. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks, Liu. And I'll go to our, our other co-editor today, um, Jose. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, my name is Jose Poro. I'm founder and CEO of Cobalt Water Global. And at Cobalt Water Global, we're actually focusing on mitigating nitrous oxide from uh, wastewater treatment facilities. And we're doing that using AI and machine learning. And AI is something that really started working with in 2013. Um, and N2O is actually something that as, um, as a group, the IWA task group started discussing back in 2009 and in 2010, we formally launched the, the task group and really ran the task group alongside the research on N2O and helping to coordinate and provide direction for the research, which over the course of a decade or a little more, uh, we were able to gain a lot of knowledge on the pathways and the influencing factors. And ultimately, the, the book, uh, is what synthesizes a lot of this research. So we're pleased to be at, be able to be launching this and and be having this webinar series, which Amanda, thanks to you taking the leadership and initiative to kick it off, uh, we've been able to do an excellent job in um, giving a I guess highlight highlight to the book and preview to what's in there. Uh, so I think it's a, it was an excellent way to get the word out. So thanks to your efforts on that. Thanks, Jose. Um, we, we can go back down under and I'll ask uh, David, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David De Haas. Um, <clears throat> as you heard, I'm also in Brisbane. Um, I've been here for approximately 25 years in Australia. I started in South Africa, as you'll probably pick up from my accent. And my background is in biological processes and my specialization is in um, actually biological nutrient removal activated search systems. And um, I work for a company called GHD in Brisbane. We're a worldwide consultancy, somewhat similar to Jacobs. And uh, we um, do you know, dis engineering across a whole range of disciplines. Um, now, my specialization, as I say, is in nutrient removal systems, and that's really what sparked my interest in nitrous oxide. I think my first encounter with it was <clears throat> working alongside Dr. James Barnard, who many of you would know as one of the fathers of, of biological pea removal systems. And he commented that nitrous oxide is produced as a, as a trace, uh, on, as a side stream um uh, in denitrification systems but not sufficient to cause any hilarity because we know it is of course laughing gas um, so that kind of sparked my interest in the 90s but really in the early 2000s i began digging further to try and understand how much of this is produced and and, and what the relativities are compared to um, energy systems and the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from energy and electricity use and that led me to work with the University of Queensland and hence the link with Liu Ye because she's also in Brisbane uh, through others, of course, at the uh, what used to be the Advanced Wastewater Management Centre in Brisbane, uh, Paul Lant and Jörg Keller and many others. So from that sparked a whole bunch of interest, papers published um, largely with colleagues um, around um, life cycle assessment, urban water systems, greenhouse gas production in those and um, more recently um, I have an interest in the emission factors that we assume for accounting purposes because from an engineering point of view we can't always get to that low level of fundamental detail we need to have some broad indication of what the emissions are from using emission factors and so that's led to a more recent paper published internationally reviewing the IPCC emission factors and comparing them against others around the world such as the system we have in Australia. 
So I guess that's my interest and I look forward to the webinar to sort of hear the broader perspectives internationally as well. Thanks, David. And now we, we, we end up in Denmark, um, which is a nice place to end with the, with the upcoming Congress soon. Um, Neria, I'll go to you and then Mikael. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, here today and congratulations on the book. I think it was a very, very necessary book and you did a great job. Um, my name is Nerea Oricarreño. I work in, in Denmark. I am an industrial PhD student with uh, DTU, the university in Copenhagen, uh, hopefully finishing soon, hopefully. Um, and I'm also a research engineer with VCS. VCS Denmark is the third largest utility in Denmark. And I've been working uh, with VCS as a research engineer since uh, 2016. And before that, uh, as a student, I'm very lucky that VCS is such a, uh, it's a utility um, very much committed to sustainability and innovation. And that has allowed me to work in uh, very interesting projects on N2O um, all, all these years. Um, I started working on N2O uh, during my master thesis, where I worked on um, operating our side stream Anamox reactors and trying to figure out a better way to control them to minimize emissions. Um, but VCS had started working on it way before. I think the first project with uh, Unisense dates back to 2011 or so. Um, and we've we've had several projects over the year. Right now, we're working on on uh, different projects. Uh, for example, trying to quantify N2O and methane using a plume system from the whole facility. Uh, trying to quantify um, nitrous oxide from trigon filters, uh, testing technology to treat N2O. And, and me particularly, I've been working on MAPR for my, for my PhD, membrane aerated biofilm reactors. We've been testing this technology in one of our facilities uh, for three years and, and N2O has been a, a big part of the, of the project. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this, uh, to this discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Neria and, um, and Mikael, last but not least. Well, uh, thank you and thank you everyone for, for letting me join as well. So my name is Mikael Landis and I have a background and PhD in PhD actually in white biotech, but uh, as a career uh, line just went up in bioreactor to the biggest one that we have at all, which is a wastewater uh, reactor. I work as a technical director at the Unisense and Unisense Environment and have actually since 2011 been developing the uh, liquid uh, phase uh, nitrous oxide uh, sensor that we are today selling um, uh, around the world. I have uh, mainly been working first with the, the development of the equipment, but also understanding what are the dynamics in, in, in wastewater uh, inactivated sludge systems and work with NREA actually for, for many years now, uh, testing both equipment, but also small uh, mitigation strategies and then working on the on the demon plan as Naria said and, and VSS has been uh, instrumental as a utility in terms of letting us have access to to test sites because pilot scale is not always good enough for, for full-scale uh, equipment test but the last I, I would say seven years I've also worked uh, with uh, understanding uh, how to do uh, mitigation in, in full scale and, and uh, unlike uh, using in digital science it's been based on on actually measurements that we have done uh, uh, and, and when nitrous oxide emissions are coinciding with the with the with turnover ammonia and and, and 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 so and also in the side stream in terms of how to avoid uh, the intense uh, emissions that you get from from these and uh, last i would say that, 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 that the data that we collect we then uh, use today to publish uh, to correct both the, the ways that we calculate the emissions, but also to get better empirical formulas for the parts of the, the dynamics that we can describe uh, by, by, by modeling. So I think this is uh, my, my main focus uh, today. Thanks very much, Mika. Um, with that, we, we've, got, we've got some initial questions and I'll, um, I'll ask 
ask you guys those. But um, please, for those attending, um, please feel free to contribute questions into the into the Q and A um, box, which you should see in questions in the in the side panel in the Go to Webinar panel. Um, and just to say, also, if um, if we feel like the data connection is struggling with us all on camera, we can also um, we can also drop off. So we'll see if if we get any feedback that the the connection quality doesn't seem great, then we'll we'll drop off webcams and we can um, just leave the questions up there. Um, but just these these were just some starting questions, and I guess um, you know we've got a, an amazing panel of and depth of experience in nitrous oxide in in from many different angles and um, you know I think there's so much we could discuss but we I thought these these are some interesting questions and particularly reflecting on the title of this discussion which is um, which is you know climate action now so I guess just with that um, and wanted to ask a first question um, you know do do we know enough to mitigate nitrous oxide now um, and what are some of the key key gaps or what else do we need to know and I guess um, I'll if it's okay Lou I'll go to you first and um, and then perhaps ask Jose to follow up um, giving you guys as, as also as co-editors of the book the, the chance to kick this discussion off thanks Leo sure sure happy to kick off to share some of my thoughts so if this is a yes or no question as a scientist I would say we don't know enough. So we always don't know enough to, to, to mitigate all the nitrous oxide that we have uh, seen from the different treatment plant. Uh, but um, the no doesn't mean that uh, we can't have any action. So we definitely can start um, think about uh, mitigation. Uh, but to me, I think uh, there are currently two um, or gaps or um, barriers I think we need to think before we take any action. Uh, first, with um, mitigation strategy that we have uh, investigated so far, uh, so far I feel that um, it is like one mitigation we found suitable for one plant, but it may not suitable to another plant, even with the same configuration. So it's not one source all thing. So how do you identify the suitable mitigation strategy for your plant? Uh, that's a question. So without monitoring, it's very difficult to comment any mitigation strategy. That's the first thing I feel. Um, second, how the risk or impact of the suggested mitigation strategy, if we implement to the plant, how that may affect the performance of the nutrient removal, or uh, are there any consequences uh, in terms of um, other aspects? And that's also something uh, we don't know so far. So um, currently in Australia, we have uh, one um, successful case, uh, which we have developed a mitigation strategy for uh, one of the full-scale treatment plant based in Adelaide. Um, so this is an SBR plant that uh, by um, two rounds of monitoring, by modeling that we proposed um, different mitigation strategy and we evaluate the potential risks uh, for different uh, consequences. Unfortunately, the plant also would like to take one step further after evaluation. Um, and then when we verify, we found, ah, it works. But it doesn't mean that all the plants will actually take that moving. Uh, the, that um, one step further. So I feel that's that's something um, with the mitigation strategy, whether uh, without enough uh, risk assessment, without, without enough evaluation, uh, whether we can really take that uh, step further. That's another, um, I feel, barrier or, uh, or gaps currently we have so far. Um, uh, last one maybe, so th if we say the two currently will be knowledge um, sort of gaps, the other one is mainly the, the technical, right? So even you take mitigation, you want to know how much exactly you have reduced. So that requires um, very accurate quantification or reliable quantification to support uh, your mitigation. Uh, so if how effective it will be, and that's another thing. And then um, again, this uh, requires um, uh, a lot of moni monitoring quantification, that's the cost. Uh, have to be considered as well. So um, I think I will um, just uh, sharing my feelings and of course open for other people's uh, thoughts as well.
Thanks, thanks, Lou. And I think, I mean, that full-scale mitigation study that you've published, and I think you mentioned the the fact that the utility, which is, is SA Water, I think, you know, we're, we're willing to to go that one step further. I think that seems so important in um, in the ability to test out some of these um, some mitigation strategies and the willingness to um, yeah to take that next step, perhaps in the absence of the the regulatory need to do so just now. Just on that, um, Jose, I know you. Um, yeah, you're you're working really closely on this as well. What um yeah, what's what's your thinking? Do we know enough now and, and what are the key gaps? Well, I think um I, I would agree with Leo that we don't know enough. I think we're gonna be continuously learning. Uh even even if we we start to mitigate into a um I think there's always gonna be things that we learn even from just a, a practical standpoint, how we apply the knowledge that we have uh, around the pathways and the influencing factors to specific facilities that have might have certain constraints or certain data gaps. I think as we do this more, we're gonna be learning more on how to better work around constraints and data gaps. Um, I also agree that, um, what you learn at one facility may not necessarily be able to apply at another facility and especially in terms of uh, mitigation strategies uh, so if you blindly take one mitigation strategy from one facility and go and apply it at another you <clears throat> may or may not uh, be able to reduce the n2o uh, because essentially each facility has its own uh, fingerprint in terms of the combination of the operation, uh, the configuration, the loading conditions, uh, the environmental conditions, and this is what makes it really difficult to uh, apply the same mitigation strategy at one site to another. It could be that you might have a similar strategy, similar control actions that you take to reduce it, but that would be only if the the combination happens to match to a certain degree the combination at another site and i think that uh, as long as you have a framework to be able to account for any of these combinations then it makes it easier to identify for a specific facility what are the control actions that can be taken and what what is the um, I guess the the cause of the N2O emissions? And I think that uh, I guess another thing is in terms of trying to get an idea of, of what the situation is and and what can be done. Uh, that's something we we can do uh, prior to monitoring uh, with with our N2O risk DSS platform, that's that's one of the ideas is that you're able to actually screen sites um, based on what sites might have higher risk. Um, and not only can we see what sites have higher risk, we can see why they have risk. And this starts to tell us what we might be able to do. But um, we can't know that for sure until we actually start monitoring, which is when we can confirm everything that we see and we can actually measure the reductions uh, when we implement the control actions that have been identified for that specific site. Um, I would say in terms of key gaps, uh, I think a big one is in the accounting side. Uh, because N2O is extremely site specific, because it is extremely variable, uh, it is extremely difficult to quantify into emissions with uh, an emission factor approach. And unfortunately, uh, right now, it, it's what what is widely accepted is is this emission factor approach. So I think this is something that um, we really need to find a better solution for, and, and it's something that we at Cobalt Water Global have been working on. Uh, and have been seeing some promising results, but it's good 
to hear that people like David are really looking into this as well, uh, because I think it's important. Um, if we want to have a somewhat accurate picture of what our N2O emissions are at a, at a specific site, and we need to be reporting those emissions, it's, a, it's important that we have a good method, because it's just not realistic that we can measure everywhere at once, all at one time. So we need to have something um, that we can that we can rely on in the meantime until we get to that those those sites to to begin our monitoring and begin our mitigation. Thanks, thanks, Jose. Um, <clears throat> would anyone else like to come in? I think the um, when I think about the, those inventory challenges, I think what you see is also a a potential risk that the regulator can't move as yet because there's not an effective means to baseline emissions and therefore any potential mitigation can't yet be added to a, a, you know, a mitigation um, or, or called a reduction if we don't have that agreed, um, you know, a, a agreed inventory baseline that we feel is, is sufficiently accurate. Um, and my worry is that sort of delays, delays progress. Um, although I think the good news is that we do see proactive utilities who are definitely taking action because it's the right thing to do or because there is that emerging regulation that maybe it may well be coming. And yeah, I just wondered if anyone else wants to to come in on yeah, that or no, else no, we no. can... Uh, yeah, I'd like David. to say something. Um, in fact, this is a symptom of the fact that wastewater treatment designs are, are not very standardised. <clears throat> So there are lots of small differences, although they may be broadly similar in many areas, there are lots of differences which tend to bedevil these comparisons around what's underlying the cause, you know, what's the underlying cause. And I think we owe it to ourselves as professionals to actively try to work on areas that look for what are the similarities in plants that tend to have higher emissions. In other words, to kind of religiously chase up the data and and as more and more people come on board with measurement and I, I'm sure Mikkel would be able to comment on this because you know you've been leading in this area of measurement um, but I think I think the the onus is on us as as the professionals working in this area to look for the similarities because only that way can we then inform you know the people like the regulators or the people who write guidelines the reality is we will have emission factor type guidelines for a very long time because it's simply not practical to to go down to the sort sort of next level of detail for many utilities especially on every small treatment plant you know in australia we have um, a very large proportion more than 80 percent of the wastewater is treated in just a few very large wastewater treatment plants uh, there are only about 20 of them so the opportunity is great because you can concentrate on those but for all the others they may account for only less than you know there may be small treatment plants of less than say a hundred thousand people but there could be hundreds of them and it gets even worse in countries like uh, like new zealand our, our neighbor where they have an even more uh, spread out and decentralized population so i think that's the key thing is that the, the gaps are there but i think we need to keep synthesizing and putting our knowledge together to understand the similarities and then kind of hone in on the key drivers the key factors Thanks, David. Uh, and I, go on, Neria, you want to come in? Yeah, just a comment and, and a question to the other panelists. Um, in terms of um, mitigation, do we know enough? And you've talked about wastewater treatment plants um, first monitoring before they can start mitigating. Do we know, do we have some sort of way of knowing this is, this is, too high, this is too low. When we mitigate, what is good enough? How much should we be mitigating? Do we have any kind of... Um, um, yeah, I think so. Nicole, would you agree? I think we have broadly a feeling of the range. Okay. I, 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 would, I would think so. So if we plot uh, all the data that we have, then we have a look at it, we see we see that um, when you get uh, really, really high in nutrient uh, removal, and then you also see that we have a fairly high uh, load 
on the capacity in the emission factors. So if you take up uh, on the next question, we can elaborate on that. I, I think in terms of what you should mitigate, uh, we will not be able to avoid nitrous oxide completely, but I think we can get it a very low with the right uh, design and the right capacity uh, as as such. In terms of mitigation in Denmark, uh, we will get back to that as well, but, but here we said that we want to reduce by 50 percent, but the baseline is not uh, qualified yet and will be over the next two years. So in terms of whether we do know enough, uh, we don't know enough to make the baseline solid in Denmark, and, and so it's ongoing research here as, as well, but it will come. But, but Neria, a high number would be sort of more than 1%, I think we could say, um, and, and a low number would be less than, say, 0.2%, uh, perhaps something like that, you know. All the data seems to show occasionally you get these very high numbers of uh, 2, 3, 4, 5 percent or even 8 percent, sometimes 25 percent, but that's very, very unusual. Yeah. Um, most of the data that I've looked at anyway from the literature uh, sits in, in a band of around about 1 percent, you know, from plus minus yeah. about 0.5 percent of the influent nitrogen to the plant. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. also my, my, my feeling that um, normal typical activity is large long-term monitoring it's always going to be in this range 0.2 to maybe one but mostly in the lower range but I, i'm not sure if we as a if we have um you know established what is low what is high and when when we're mitigating uh, and we say we want to mitigate 50 percent it doesn't matter if we start at 0.5 or 0.8 or uh, <laughs> um, I think that goes to Mikkel's point about establishing the baseline and, and that can only come when there's a good body of evidence for the geographic location and the type of treatment plan. Yeah, um, I think I, I agree. We haven't uh, got this benchmark yet, uh, but uh, based on uh, currently common sense, um, uh, if you have a high strength, high loading uh, treatment uh, like the digest liquors, you normally will expect relatively higher emissions than just normal domestic wastewater uh, treatment. And also, if you um, uh, saying for domestic normal like uh, strengths uh, domestic wastewater, you already reach above two percent. That's basically already reached to the higher end. Uh, so this 0.2 percent, what David mentioned, is also we have seen you know, quite large treatment plant uh, in Australia when we're doing the monitoring. And uh, we see the, the other end, which is same configuration, uh, very same, very similar configuration, but rich to 1.9%. So, uh, so we can see the treating same level of ammonia, but with very different level of emissions. Uh, so definitely uh, with the higher end, uh, maybe they have uh, an opportunity to reduce uh, more. But in terms of how much we can reduce, uh, I think based on my current knowledge, uh, there are not a lot um, established sort of uh, case with full scale uh, um, mitigation implemented so far. Um, with the one that we did in Australia, we managed to reduce by 30% 30, 30 of nitrous oxide emission. Um, so, and that plant is uh, initial emission is less than 1%. Uh, and it's after reduce, it's like 0.6, 0 0.7% emission factor. So um, again, there. Um, I think to better understand this, uh, we need to um, uh, establish the, the 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 baseline, the baseline background monitoring using a, a great a great uh, methodology. Then with the data we collected, that will also be contributing to identify the similarity. That David is looking for, and then that will help us. We, pr we propose a more accepted, well accepted mitigation strategy to similar situations. So without applying uh, a well agreed monitoring approach, if everyone is doing monitoring themselves with different uh, method or different lens with different sort of uh, um, uh, sort of standard themselves, uh, it's very difficult to. Uh, uh, well, extract that information from the data. So I think uh, by working together, 
uh, jointly, I think uh, if we agree on an acceptable approach, and then we can using that approach and then doing monitoring, collect uh, the baseline data from uh, a lot of different type configuration of treatment plan with different scenarios that will definitely help um, uh, eventually to get uh, a more sort of a, a greater you know, similarity sort of trend from that help with mitigation. Leo, you sparked a thought as you were speaking, and I suddenly realized the methodology needs to include a set of parameters that define the reactor configuration and loading rate in a consistent way. Yes. So that we can make the comparisons. You know, so we need to be able to describe and define and compare these treatment plans. And if you don't have that information, you won't be able to do it. So I think that's what I've seen missing in some of the literature. It's very hard to compare treatment plan configurations. And the benefit of a discussion like this is we get to start sharing some of this. And Naria, you've been exactly looking at this, I think, in your research just now. So please go ahead yeah. and then we go to Miko. <laughs> yeah, the, the last piece of research uh, on my PhD, looking at the N2O for the MABR that we were testing, uh, as I was writing the article, I was facing this challenge. OK, I have this number for my MABR system. Is, is this low? Is this high? Uh, it's lower than IPCC. Is that good enough? Um, so what I did, what we did is we scanned the literature for full-scale reporting of n data, but only taking data that had been monitored um, for more than a month so that we were not taking just like spot campaigns that can um, uh, create noise maybe. Um, and then what we found was a very strong correlation between the nitrogen loading grade to that reactor that they were measuring and the emission factor, like beautiful linear regression. You have your activated sludge on the first part of the of the line with a, um, a very low nitrogen loading rate and very low emission factor. And then you have your size streams uh, treatments on the right side with very high nitrogen loading rates and, and very high emission factors. And then uh, we use this benchmark to say, okay, my MABR is loaded halfway it's in between an activated sludge and a side stream. Where should that be in the line? Um, that might have been maybe two, three percent. We've got 0.8. Okay, that's uh, that should be a good number for this um, for this specific uh, loading rate. That's that's the approach we we found um, best. That's fascinating. That's really good. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. And I think we need to think about maybe other parameters too, you know, such as the aeration type, the aeration intensity, the oxygen, uh, particularly recycles, internal plant recycles, and how and where they're positioned in terms of you know, what we've seen on step feed systems, Liu, in, in South Australia and elsewhere. So I just think there are a few other key things that we can mm -hmm. identify that are process engineering things that will begin to help um, bring some order to the data or system, system systematic. And I think this ties in well with what Jose was saying, saying as well in terms of screening, a process for screening, like what are the what is the process? What's going on within that process? Is it a nitrifying mm -hmm. plug flow ASP, which is very prevalent here in the UK? Um, or, you know, wh what's happening with the liquors? Is there side stream treatment? What type of aeration system and control and control valve, you know, operation is there? And I um, yeah, I, I guess this ties on quite nicely to, to the next question in our list, which I've, I've taken the list off right now, but I'll, I'll post it in the chat. Um, and also to a, a question we've had from um, from the audience, which is um, which is around, um, you know, well, the question is, what, what will be the process treatment solutions in your view to minimise or maybe eliminate um, nitrous oxide? And I guess we could think about sort of short, medium and long term process treatment solutions or mitigation strategies. I'm going to go to you first, Mikhail, but I'll just also pick up on the question um, from Kimberly, which is, you know, will we constantly need to change our mitigation control actions based on the variation we see in sites throughout the year? So I guess that's, I know that's something you've been working on in, in Denmark. So if you're happy to pick up, that would be great, Mikhail. So let me, let me, thank you for the question and let me take that one first. So uh, what we do see is that we have a high seasonal variation. So that also means that the mitigation controls will really depend on, on where you are in season. And it's, 
it could be easy to correlate this with temperature, but we have actually not been able to correlate uh, high emission seasons because they can be both winter and, and, and summer. They are really dependent on a multitude of, of, of factors. And I think this is where data science comes in as well to actually try to solve and decipher what, what, what goes on. But what we do see in, in, in many places is sort of a spring emissions that come up. And here it's uh, even out the load or reducing the amount of nitrates in the water. Whereas in the winter time, for example, a control will be much more around controlling how much carbon is available for full denitrification because then that is really struggling. And remember that most of what we do here in Denmark and in, in Europe will be full BNR plants that we are working on. It's a global uh, session, this one. So we will see uh, a lot of nitrification uh, plants as well. So I think uh, I think uh, one emission strategy will work uh, maybe for for half a year or, or a few months, and then you need to change or or, or 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 adjust your your strategy, and that actually calls for sort of uh, automation in 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 some sense in terms of mitigation. So that was that was uh, that was to the question, and then in terms of, of uh, process treatment and solutions that will mitigate, the bold answer will be that we do this abiotic instead of biotic, and then uh, we, 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 we <laughs> then we solve the problem. But uh, perhaps that is the really really long uh, long term uh, term time. In the short term, what we have actually been able to do actually within a few months is to achieve uh, better than 50% reductions working with data and looking at what are the triggers at, at that uh, type uh, or, or, or time uh, where we, we measure. And, and uh, I'll present at IWA here in Copenhagen, I've done before. We see, for example, that diluting out the substrate, so lowering the amount of ammonium per bacteria per time is really key to mitigate mm -hmm. nitrogen. So that also means that if you have side stream operations that have a high strength, high turnover per volume, then you will likely see higher, higher emissions. And, and what actually goes on as uh, cities grow is that we see wastewater treatment plants getting less rainwater in because that is uh, deferred uh, into uh, to natural water systems. But then the city grows and the water amount stays the same, but the strength uh, increases in the wastewater. And this is also where we see much higher emissions. And that is actually from the bigger wastewater treatment plants in, in Europe uh, for the most, where we see the highest uh, emissions. So on the short term, it's really uh, working with uh, what you have in terms of infrastructure. And here we've had uh, great success by, by implementing simultaneous nitrification, denitrification uh, processes, where you try to to uh, both do nitrification and denitrification in the available volume that you have. Uh, and, and, and with this, you can actually achieve uh, very, very high uh, emission reduction, so up to 80 uh, plus percent. But what you also benefit from is that you actually increase the capacity of the wastewater treatment plant or the treatment capacity of the treatment plant significantly by, by, by doing this. There's That's a interesting, Michael. Yeah. I just wanted to say that's the same pathway we followed in terms of optimizing nitrogen removal in the 1990s um, because um, it, it also was about um, you know going for bigger treatment plants that have lower reactor loading rates um, in order to get the best nitrogen removal. This is at a time in Australia and in other parts of the world like uh, the northeast of the US when the total nitrogen targets on the effluent were dropping below five milligrams per liter to three and even two milligrams per liter. And so it was the same thing where um, you know, um, the carousel type plants uh, that were bigger, that have a big internal recirculation rate where the ammonia concentration in the reactor is, is spread out and is very low, they seem to be useful. So these seem to be a similar trajectory here, and that is that if you can advance the nitrogen removal and build systems that are, are lower loaded, it's an advantage, but unfortunately, it, it got very expensive. And so the opposite direction became making the asset work harder to achieve the same or close to the same level of nitrogen removal, but increasing the intensity of the process. And I think that led to, you know, a whole bunch of processes coming back that had been used in the 70s, like step feed, for example which is then uh, the opposite, where you don't have a big reactor recycle rate, but you spread out the, the influent and you mix it up with internal 
partial nitrification in steps. And that, for example, um, is another way to achieve nitrogen removal and economize on space and reactor, but increases the ammonia concentration at specific points that are critical and then become big uh, flash points for nitrous oxide. Um, so I, I'm only drawing attention to those because those are the ones I know, but there are many permutations of the sort of thing. And I'm just agreeing with you that the systems that generally optimize nitrogen removal and increase, uh, or sorry, decrease the loading rate, increase the reactor size, seem to be uh, good mitigation pathways, but they cost a lot of money. Yeah, but my, my point here is actually that we use assets that are already there, but we use them better. And and remember yeah. that, that size was also built to handle hydraulic load, but that is also now deferred due to climate change. And so, so water, uh, rainwater is, uh, you know, we try to get that out of our sewer system, but that generates that higher load on the infrastructure that, that, that we have. Just bear in mind that when we do simultaneous nitrification, denitrification, we are running at DO levels that we cannot measure with ordinary probes. We are really really low in, 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 wow. in oxygen. So, so in, in this case here, we can always catch, you know, uh, first flush. And so, uh, because we have plenty of aeration capacity available to remove uh, ni uh, ammonium uh, afterwards. But it, I think there are also other technologies coming up where we can increase the, uh, the, um, the capacity in the plant. So in area, maybe you should tell a bit more on, on, on the results when adding cassettes to uh, activated slot systems. Yeah, thanks. Um, that that was the whole, um, you know, the whole hypothesis with the MAPR work and the N2O was um, we've seen before that if you dilute the load, right? If you if you get more, uh, if you get your microbial community that you don't stress them out, you will have less N2O emissions. That um, seem to explain why we were getting so. Um, high N2O emissions in the size stream. We also have an example from when um, we were running a monitoring campaign for the EPA here in Denmark, and we, um, um, not on purpose, like it, it did coincide that we were doing a monitoring campaign, but we changed operation in our reactors from parallel, which they have been operated for, for decades in parallel. We changed them to series. So, so then one of the two reactors was getting double the load, concentrations of ammonia were much higher, and the N2O just went like um, over the, like skyrocketed, um, crazy amounts of N2O. Um, so so the, the whole idea with MAPR, the hypothesis is can we do intensification, can we get a lot more out of our reactors, or, out of our, our concrete, and still have low and low emissions. Um, and um, the results from the pilot are, are positive. Um, I think on average, we were getting median value 0 0.5, 0 0.8 emission factor on average. Um, in our case, um, because we were supplementing with fine bubble aeration in the MABR pilot reactor, we were getting a lot of um, emissions from the from the activated sludge, not so much from the MABR. Um, but we are so we we expect in a in a full scale installation it will be much lower than what we have got. Um, we're starting a new project now where we're gonna retrofit uh, one of our smaller wastewater treatment plants with MABRs. So it's gonna be a full scale. Uh, retrofit, and we we plan to monitor. We are already establishing a baseline, and we plan to monitor monitoring N2O and see what is the effect on the whole on the whole treatment plant. Um, and I wanted to comment on, on something that Michael said before because it's really interesting. On our even on our MABR work, we saw that emissions will increase during the summer. And uh, but when we were doing the multivariate analysis, we couldn't find there was no correlation between temperature and and N2O. So it was not the temperature, but again, it was the load as a proxy for uh, yeah. So it was uh, so temperature was a proxy for for the load, but it was actually the load that was causing the N2O emissions. Yeah, and I think that's what might have happened in some of the studies where we've seen. Um, some inconsistency. Is that because you, you get less dilution in summer? Is that the case? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, less. Because um, um, it stops rain, snowing. Less. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, it never snows in Denmark anymore. <laughs> uh, well, that's right. Yeah. Unfortunately. So, but one comment on, on on the temperature. Actually, we have looked at it uh, using DNA technologies just to see at how the community changes, and we cannot see a correlation between community temperature and uh, and uh, emissions. But what we do believe is that some of the ammonium oxidizing bacteria have a faster turnover and ends up at nitrous oxide at around 15 to 20 degrees and this is why we see this in the in 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 this uh, in this in the springtime but this is this is a personal uh, belief uh, because we cannot see it uh, with other tools and it's really really hard to test this in the in in the lab uh, because it's only a few pure cultures of these that we uh, that we have available yeah um i can I share some of my thoughts um, with uh, what um, uh, Miko shares and Debbie comments also uh, Narea talks about the new technology. Um, I think I can summarize the mitigation strategy. Um, if you want to apply any mitigation strategy, um, I would suggest um, starting from uh, the process based um, or parameters that you can easily manipulate. Uh, for example, dissolved oxygen and uh, also if you can change the loading uh, if you use step feed maybe change the ratio of your step feed so that's something doesn't cost that much using your existing uh, infrastructure uh, however some of the mitigation strategy may need you to change or um, build additional infrastructure uh, for example we have seen um, uh, like uh, one of our studies uh, uh, also deal with the step feed. It's it's not some easily uh, sorted out by change the feed ratio, but you have also uh, need to change the rest ratio. Uh, basically, you have to provide more return activity sludge uh, to your additional steps to make sure you have enough bacteria working for you as well. So that's something we'll need um, the utility to build additional uh, under ground pipelines uh, with the with the rest return so that's basically not easy uh, to be achieved or uh, implemented in a short time um, so with the mitigation strategy um, I guess again uh, definitely uh, there are some common uh, saying factors may uh, attribute it to high n two o, and also uh, there with the new technology the nitrite shunt uh, MABR uh, or um, Animox, uh, there are upcoming studies, but I think uh, also um, with the new uh, new technology or new um, sort of uh, research coming in, we, we probably will also get more understanding about what are the key operational parameters may affect uh, N2O. Um, so uh, basically, again, with the mitigation strategy, um, uh, starting with something may easily to change uh, and then based on the monitoring uh, and then if you get the already um, the setup uh, I think once you start monitoring you probably can correlate some of the emissions with the operation uh, with the um, specific features of your plant and see uh, if any of this that may attribute and help uh, you to identify something you can change for the operation. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Liu. And I think, you know, it's been great to hear about the um, the mitigation that's happening now already, things like um, dissolved oxygen set points, you know, things that we can easily change. I think um, promoting simultaneous nitrification, denitrification, you know, work into MABRs, which could help us with future augmentation, uh, and also perhaps tackle capital carbon as well as process emissions. Um, and then, you know, future future thinking beyond that. Um, I, I just wondered, Jose, if you wanted to um, to yeah, to to come in and, and maybe tying in with the, the another one of the questions that we've we've got, which is around um, uh, around data. So you, you know what are the opportunities um, when we look at the process data we have um, and I guess um, and the data that we can get from monitoring um that could help drive those mitigation solutions and and you know maybe you could talk a little bit about the work you're doing and also pick up on um the seasonality and maybe the need to revisit sites to um to keep a, a, a model 
um, yeah, updated. Sorry, that's not that's too long a question, but um, please, yeah, please talk to this a little bit because I know you're doing some really interesting work in this area. Sure. So, yeah, I guess I guess one thing um, I just wanted to comment on in, in, with regard to like configurations, and I think it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in terms of looking at uh, the combination of the operation and loading environmental conditions um, that contribute to a specific situation in terms of the m2o emissions and i think it's really not so dependent on configuration but operation um, so i think theoretically you can have any configuration but if you have the right conditions it doesn't matter what configuration you have it's going to be more related to the operation that's going to drive whether you have high or low emissions, um, and in, in, but in terms of like the di the different combinations and what are the the control actions that can be taken, um, well one one of the things that we've done uh, in, in going through the literature and the research was um, develop develop a N2L risk knowledge base so we can look at the risk quantify the risk and be able to see what is contributing to this risk and what can be done to avoid the risk and reduce the emissions. And by following this, we can do things like increase dissolved oxygen or decrease dissolved oxygen or increase carbon dosing. Um, so if we're able to look at any situation, we should be able to identify what control actions can be taken using this framework. And we've had success in, in the Netherlands working with Waterboard De Domo, uh, Waterboard An Mas, where we've achieved uh, up to 90% reduction on N2O uh, just by adjusting the dissolved oxygen. Um, also recently in the UK working with Welsh Water, uh, we had 80 to 90% reduction uh, again, just by adjusting the DO. And what we like to do is, is really fine tune the, the current operation and the, the current control because it, it, it was set up for a specific reason uh, to meet a specific effluent quality. So we don't really want to change that. But if you look at the default operation, uh, you find times where they can potentially be at high risk either due to high DO conditions or due to low DO conditions because each one is going to implicate a different N2O pathway. Uh, so what we try to do is fine tune it so that we get them away from those high risk areas but keep the same control. Uh, and I think that this, we've had a lot of success with, with this approach. Um, you could into the future, uh, I, I think, or even now look at really advanced control, uh, taking a lot of different things into account and, and using things like AI and machine learning to help guide what you need to be doing to balance all of the different objectives because there could be energy consumption, um, minimizing energy consumption as an objective, obviously maintaining the effluent quality which should never be compromised but there could be uh, objectives like minimizing chemical consumption. Uh, and now obviously we have N2O in the picture that we need to take into account. Uh, so you can get into some really advanced and, and complex control strategy to balance all of that. But I think that in the meantime, uh, just fine tuning the current control is, is important. Um, another comment on the seasonality, um, what we've seen a lot is with the default operation and, and of course we're tracking the risk uh, you see the risk profile change over the course of the year uh, where you might have uh, and typically it's you have high uh, risk due to high deal conditions in the colder months and then you have high risk due to low deal conditions in the warmer months uh, in this it's not surprising if you think about it because with the higher temperatures, you have higher activity uh, from, from the bacteria. And I think operators like to pick up on this because they can get uh, 
the same treatment or even more treatment, um, even by turning down their aeration. So in the summer months, they're able to uh, save a bit on the energy consumption, but still meet their effluent quality. But um, inherently what this does, it, it, it puts you at risk due to the low DO condition. And if you're at risk and you have higher activity, you tend to have higher N2O emissions uh, because you're stressing the bacteria under uh, conditions where you're going to be prompting a specific N2O pathway. And this can happen with high DO conditions as well as with low DO conditions. So this is something that we've been seeing with just the default operation. And, and of course, what we want to do is change that so we can avoid these situations. And, and I think that in terms of the data question, uh, I think that with uh, just the current data collection, you should have enough to be able to tell you what you might be able to do because most places are monitoring at least at a minimum the dissolved oxygen and because this plays such a big role in what your n2o emissions can be uh, as long as you understand what the other process conditions are uh, you should be able to come up with a strategy to either increase your dissolved oxygen or decrease the dissolved oxygen to a point where you're not negatively impacting the process but still reduce your N2O. Thank, thanks, Jose. Mikhail, did you want to come in a bit? Because obviously the, the S&D, you know, it's relying on a very low level of DO. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, the microbial community and the process type that we're talking about does matter in this conversation. But, I, you know, we see mitigation opportunities in mm -hmm. both areas, I would say. Yeah, just one, one comment is that actually in, in, in Northern Europe, or at least in, in Denmark and and a few other countries we actually don't use DO at all for controlling our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, it's uh, ammonium-based or nitrate-based uh, controllers, and 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 all of a sudden the dynamics are, are very different uh, and not really driven by by oxygen, but by driven by something else. But of course, then you push the sludge into another community than a standard uh, nitrification denitrification. Uh, so, so as I said before, when we run uh, simultaneous nitrification and denitrification, we actually don't want to see any oxygen on our oxygen sensors that are still there. So we don't see low DO as a risk. Larry, did you want to? Yeah, unless Jose wants to follow up on, on that. Uh, yeah, sure. So when we're talking about adjusting the DO, it may not be because it's uh, controlled with DO, but if it's ammonia-based control, um, yeah, it's going to be controlled based on the ammonia concentrations. But there are limits that you set with the with the dissolved oxygen. So based on the range, if you're if you're measuring the dissolved oxygen, you're going to see a certain range of dissolved oxygen, and, and that range is. Um, where you can see periods where you're at high risk or, or low risk, depending on what your ammonia concentration is. And, and this is what we, we try to fine tune. And this is what we have been able to take high emissions to, to very low emissions. And just to point out here in the UK, for example, where we, we aren't yet seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of um, nitrifying plug flow activated sludge plants that uh, we haven't had TN consent so we do have a lot of legacy DO controlled nitrifying ASP so I think it really whereas a lot of the research around N2O has been for nitrifying and denitrifying systems and much of the work right now is going to have more you know may have more advanced the, the existing facilities have different control but I would yeah I would say there's, there's definitely opportunities around um, DO set points here for the asset base we have for now, um, but I, yeah, I think this is really interesting. Um, Neria, did you want to, to come in and then we might move to the topic of monitoring and accuracy? Yeah, just a, just a short comment on the mitigation, short, mid, long term that I think I didn't answer before. Um, um, I think we're going to see a lot, a lot of utilities doing um, mitigation like the one we're talking about right now, um, short term. Um, I think midterm we're gonna see uh, hopefully 
I don't know if hopefully but regulation like the one that might come in place in Denmark um, in a few years. Um, I'm excited about a project we're running where we're testing um, the catalytic treatment for AFCAS. And I think that might be a long term. Uh, that's how I see wastewater treatment plants long term, fully covered and either either treating the Afghas or finding uh, finding a use for everything in it, uh, including the N2O. Um, yeah, just that. Um, um, yeah, I think there's opportunities for for new technology in that area as well, but that will take uh, a very long time. And we don't even know if it's feasible. So that's something we're trying to figure out with our project, whether that's um, cost and environmentally uh, feasible. But if it is, it's going to be an interesting um, solution. Thanks, Maria. And is it fair to say that project, I think you're focusing on an existing covered side stream like a liquor treatment plant because it, it gives you the ability to, to have those emissions captured already. Um, so this is a really nice place to start as well because it's a very concentrated, um, yeah, high ammonia we're loaded. <laughs> we're testing three sites. So we're testing two mainstream uh, treatment plants in Denmark, which are fully covered because uh, they're brand new. And um, we're also going to test at Ivy Mule, which is not covered. We will test on our side stream. Uh, which is the the one unit that's covered, and it's also more concentrated. Um, so we'll test both mainstream and side stream. Brilliant! Thanks. This is yeah. really really interesting. Yeah, can I comment um, on? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I got two comments. One is about the um, uh, uh, like how long we should monitoring. Uh, I feel that uh, so far we do not have a conclusion yet, uh, but if you can notice some obvious uh, operational change happen to your plant, that's definitely um, you should uh, you, you should monitor whenever, for example, set point of DO, whatever, you, you, you think you will change that, you should cover the monitoring on both this change. And also if the plant is receiving uh, variations of the loadings, uh, in summer or winter. Um, also, if you, we are not sure whether, whether it's the temperature play the major role or it's the loading, then I would suggest we should cover those uh, change of uh, seasons as well. And uh, maybe um, I think that's a, a few sampling round that should last uh, at least uh, a few months that you see whether these different seasons all have different uh, variations in terms of N2O. Uh, so that's my personal feeling. Um, we don't have any documented regulation in terms of the length yet. Um, so uh, this is the first comment in terms of how long we should covering for monitoring. Um, in terms of the DO, so uh, we with the with the mitigation that we have uh, implemented in the plan, uh, what we suggest is an SND. So uh, basically, that is uh, one of the strategies suggested by our modeling. Our first strategy is basically get a better deal set point control, uh, basically uh, control at 2.5. The but second uh, is basically reduce that set point to 0.5 and push an SND happen. Um, so based on what we found, we didn't say that low DO um, affect uh, the N2 emission at all. Um, uh, in fact, we found that uh, reduced the N2 emission factor by 30%. And also in terms of the effluent quality, we did not see any compromise of nitrogen removal uh, in terms of the treatment uh, of the plant. That's what we have observed. Um, uh, so in terms of the um, uh, filamentous bacteria, filamentous bacteria, I think that's asked uh, in the question. Uh, by implementing, um, uh, we didn't say this uh, sludge bulking happened. Um, that's, uh, I think this, because of filamentous bacteria is many, many reasons. Huh? DO is one, only one of the reasons. So uh, I cannot say that uh, uh, this will not trigger, but at least for the plant that we implemented, we didn't say um, the problem of filamentous bacteria. But there may be other reasons uh, which will trigger filamentous uh, sludge bulking. So that's not, not something we have seen so far. And also in terms of um, uh, whether reduce or, or change DO, I think 
basically is linked with what is the reason of your N2 generation pathway. DO play a major role if, if it's really affected by a nitrate fire because we see a dissolved oxygen really affect a lot of AOB activity. Uh, so if you, a lot of N2O is coming from uh, your AOB based uh, nitrification pathway, the DO, change DO may affect that effectively. However, if it's coming from denitrification, basically you don't have enough carbon source, uh, change DO does not help. Uh, you need to, to give enough carbon. So I think uh, again, how which mitigation strategy you want to adopt, you need to monitor and you need to link that with um, your plant operation, with the treatment uh, performance you have, and then identify the potential reasons about the N2O generation. So I think that's the um, uh, uh, sort of uh, comments I would like to share based on the previous discussion. Can I ask Thanks, a quick Liu. question? Yeah, go on, Jose. No, so Liu, I was just curious, um, when you went from high DO to only low DO, um, was this, uh, did you see, um, but there were still N2O emissions, right? So you said there was 30%. There we, we, we couldn't completely get rid of N2O uh, from that. Uh, the emission factor reduced, but we still have uh, N2O. It's just uh, something coming with the nitrification, denitrification. Mm. We yeah, did see. A... Um, mm. oh, go ahead. Um, I just say we we did say the uh, reduction of N2O generation um, right. because in that plant, yeah, that that plant is mainly attributed by the uh, AOB um, based pathways. So yeah. um, uh, so that helps reduce uh, to reduce that N2O uh, from those. Uh, however, for the other plant where we see. Uh, obviously was uh, mainly attributed to denitrification. Uh, a lot of times um, the playing with DO set point doesn't really help with that. Yeah, so I guess one thing that we, ha we have seen, which is consistent with um, what you observed in that case, is that you, you could have situations where you have two, both AOB pathways occurring. Uh, because the, as we mentioned, like for ammonia-based control, for example, you, you're switching back and forth from higher DO to lower DO. Uh, so if you were essentially to change that so that you only have low DO and, and you're trying to uh, prompt SND, uh, what I mean, this is my hypothesis, but effectively what you're doing is you're eliminating one of the pathways. So whether you go to only high DO or whether you'll go to only low DO, you're, you've taken out one of the pathways. So you should see some reduction, um, but not elimination because you still have uh, one of the pathways occurring. Um, and then in terms of the denitrification, you, you're, you're totally correct if you're changing DO and then a part of the process where you have nitrification happening, you shouldn't see that help too much with the denitrification. However, uh, and depending on the configuration, so this is where uh, configuration can can play a role. Uh, that that the higher dissolved oxygen from the nitrification will get recycled in the internal recycle to the denitrification. And what we've seen in those specific situations is that lowering the DO, if it was high in the nitrification part, actually helped reduce the N2O in the denitrification because now you didn't have uh, dissolved oxygen contributing to incomplete uh, heterotrophic denitrification. So I guess it, it's really configuration dependent, but again, regardless of configuration, there are things you can do. And, and with that, I think it would be good to move on to um, the key challenges in monitoring and the accuracy of monitoring. We've talked a lot about the, the plant specifics and the need to go to sites, you know, long-term or intermittently over the long-term to try and 
um, understand those seasonal variations. But I guess I'm going to ask Mik Mikhail first, um, you know, what are the key, obviously you've been involved in the development of the world's only liquid phase nitrous oxide sensor to date. Um, we can measure in the off gas as well. Um, and one of the questions from the panel, I think, is if, you know, if, if, um, if measurement technology wasn't a problem, you know, what would we ideally be monitoring to optimise for, for um, mitigation? But yeah, Mikhail, if you could just talk a little bit about the, the challenges, you know, what is the accuracy we have in monitoring um, and what else, you know, what other work is, is being done um, and needs to be done to, to really help us mitigate at a speed that we might say is required to address the climate crisis as we see these horrific floods in, um, yeah, around the world. Well, I represent the equipment that sort of takes the bottom-up approach in, in terms of looking at the, what is actually produced in, in the liquid phase, and then we calculate the emissions. And uh, we are, I would say we have an accuracy where we are within 20% uh, from, from the real situation. And that is based on, on uh, inaccuracy in, in sensing, uh, of course, but also in terms of airflow measurement. And then we have the off-gas equipment that is, that is also run, and, and since it's calibrated against certified gases, uh, the gas measurement there can be quite, uh, quite good, or, or we set that as, uh, as the standard from which we then measure our 20% uh, off uh, as, a, as a maximum. But airflow measurement in hoods has actually also been shown to have be a real, real challenge to to know what is the airflow in 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 the hood. So that's something to be aware of. But if you look at the uh, to the question that we do have uh, the monitoring uh, available, where would we we monitor? I would really go for for the rate of change of nitrous oxide because that that is actually where I believe that we need to to go in order to make automation in terms of uh, of controlling GO ammonium turnover return cycle of nitrates and, and so forth, is really to see how the uh, concentration of nitrous oxide changes as a function of uh, any controller in, in, in the system. We do know in terms of measuring that it is where the ammonium is turned over that we, we need to look first in terms of uh, nitrous oxide emissions. But uh, following up on the discussion from before, be aware that if you are turning over ammonium in a high background of nitrates, then the emissions will go sky high. And that's because now you start all the pathways that you talked about before. So here it doesn't matter whether you have low or high EO, as long as you turn over ammonium, a lot of this will end up as a nitrous oxide uh, one, one way or, or the other. So it might look uh, textbook clean in terms of modeling and so, but actually in reality it is a, a mixture and, and quite heterogeneous uh, as you go through a block flow tank or as you turn up and down uh, the turnover. But measurement uh, in a, uh, of a completely covered plant will uh, most likely give you the most accurate climate emission, but solving the emission problem is then the next challenge that you'll have in a system like this. So measure where ammonium is turned over and then look at the emission, either calculated or measure with uh, off-gas uh, instruments would be my, uh, my, my answer. And the risk, or just just to comment on the uh, uncertainties, key factors, uh, just transporting them from one plant to another, that will always generate a higher uncertainty than whatever method that you use on site to, to measure with. So I think that that is one thought to, to, to keep in mind that the key factors are really top down and they are very good at making policies and regulations and so, but if it comes to sort of the the third bottom line for a utility, then measurements might be uh, in any form uh, a much better solution than uh, than a key number. Thanks for that, Mikhail. Um, would anyone else like to to come in on that? I know um, Liu, for example, a lot of the work to date in academia has been on off gas, using off gas monitoring, um, and I think now there's we're seeing some. Um, sites that have both liquid phase and off gas, and I think there's challenges, as Mikhail says, you know, there's challenges with both. But I guess, um, uh, yeah, what, what would your thoughts yeah. be? Yeah, uh, well, just sharing my um, experience we have got. So, um, based on what we had found, we found uh, we talk a lot about seasonal variations, but indeed, within the plant, uh, there is a big spatial variations as well. 
So um, that really put the question, where you measure, how many locations you should measure as well. Because if you put uh, the, the hood, all the sensors at different locations, and then you will get different emission factor. So I think that's the first practical question. A lot of utilities asking, how many places I should measure? And how many sensors, how many hood I should put? Second, where to put them, right? So, uh, so I think uh, Mikol shared some about the very good thoughts um, in terms of like ammonia turning over, uh, like when you see this, uh, uh, the ammonia variation concentration happens within your in your plant. You may see there will be variations about N2 generation. And another uh, common uh, feature we have seen with the variation, a lot of times it's really depend on how many zones that you control your dissolved oxygen set point. If you have a long plug flow reactor, you actually already divided into three different aeration zones with different set point, then I would suggest naturally you would like to monitor each of the zones because you have a various key control parameter that in differences, not only the, with the flow variation, concentration variation, but also with a different uh, control parameter variation there. Uh, and also uh, in terms of the challenge with the hood, of course, um, it is the, the equipment itself, the whole setup, because you, when you capture it, you have to capture simultaneously, right? So that means multiple locations, uh, you're measuring simultaneously. So it's an automated control, gas phase control channel. You have design, you have a PLC, you take uh, the gas concentration from different locations, you have to monitor all the flow. And also you want to, to, um, to know the temperature at different locations, the many parameters that you have to capture. So it is difficult, also very costly. So, and also another uh, practical um, uh, sort of thing we, we have seen is when we get a lot of this data coming in, the utilities don't know how to analyze the data as well. Um, so that's all like uh, challenges we are facing in terms of the, the monitoring. And also currently we, we try to also address another very practical questions uh, with the plan that we are doing uh, monitoring at Melbourne water. Uh, very obviously that uh, we uh, we believe uh, with the flow rate, you can use either the plant flow rate, if a good aeration monitored accurate, or you use the hood capture flow rate. In theory, if you it's all accurately measured, and then you should have the same flow rate. In that case, the based on assumption that your measurement, you have a really representative flux from the covered area. However, we found these actually we found some variations in terms of the flow. So the method itself need to be verified. Uh, and also with um, uh, with the liquid phase, I think with the unisense sensors, uh, also uh, we found some uh, it, in overall it aligns with off gas very well. But uh, uh, the one thing is um, sometimes the, the the sensor we did see. Uh, the signals sometimes it aligns well, but occasionally it didn't align well. Uh, secondly, indeed, we have a, a less lifetime of the of the sensor compared with currently the uh, the gas phase analyzer they have. I think that's all practical um, situations we are facing. So with all of these um, challenges we have, uh, that's probably the next thing we have to work together again to work out what's the best what's the best um, uh, monitoring protocols we should provide uh, a hands-on protocol that industry can use uh, by themselves and guide them uh, to get the right equipment and pull the right location and uh, capture the, the data and analyze what they have. So only if that is available, then that will allow the uh, what we have discussed uh, like to link this with the plan operation and the think about mitigation, then only if the first step become available, we can enable the next mitigation steps. Thanks, Lou. And just, just as we come to a close, I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we've gotten bogged down in, um, in a good way in, in lots of the detail and lots, lots more challenges. But I think at the, at the beginning, we've established that, you know, there are, um, there is action happening already. Um, and we know enough 
to do mitigation if we go site by site we can learn we can take action just if, i guess probably a probably possibly a final question or we might have one final round but and david i'm going to go to you you know what do you think I, I think regulation was mentioned you know there was a really interesting um lca paper out that um, michael recently shared which in the abstract suggests that we need a carbon tax for nitrous oxide to drive to drive momentum but um david what what do you think will drive more rapid action on nitrous oxide You're muted. Um, thank you, Amanda. I think largely the driver is going to come from the governance of water utilities. Um, because if you think about it, um, at a societal level or at the sort of central government level, um, nitrous oxide emissions or wastewater treatment emissions in general are a very small fraction of societal greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, even if we're out by a factor of two or three, it doesn't matter. It's still probably less than 1% of society's emissions, much less than 1% in the case of nitrous oxide. Um, so I think if we're going to wait for central governments to come along and legislate in this area, it's going to take a long time because they've got much bigger fish to fry. But what wastewater treatment systems do is they aggregate the emissions. So whilst the emissions per person might be small, a water utility has an opportunity to deal with the emissions of potentially millions of people at one point, which is the wastewater treatment plant. And so if the water utilities themselves have, have governance, um, in other words, they have targets or objectives that might be either you know, local government or state government perhaps driven or even just by their own boards accountability in terms of their environmental track record. Um, these will be the things that will drive it. They'll be wanting to, to be making their contribution, that the water sector would be making its contribution. Um, one of the problems I think is going to be the cost of the mitigation. Um, we, yes, we've been talking about some of the low hanging fruit and we've said, you know, we can bring the emission factor or the degree of emissions down substantially, but the complete elimination could be tricky. And I think in that area, it's more likely to be cost effective for the utilities to generate carbon offsets um, just because of the, the cost. You know, if you look at the cost of some of the major capital work that goes into these wastewater treatment plants. Once you've got beyond just the operational changes, which could could actually save you money, as uh, you know, Jose has um, been um, highlighting, and Liu and others. Um, but when you start getting to big capital infrastructure changes, such as having to cover reactors um, and treat treat the off gas, I think it's a great idea. It, it'll do a lot, uh, but that's only going to happen on the really big treatment plants where you get economies of scale. But for the rest, I think we could be looking at costs per tonne of CO2E uh, mitigated that could be in the order of hundreds, thousands of dollars per tonne, whereas the, the cost of carbon in the market that we could generate by things like changing practices in agriculture or, you know, getting carbon back into the soil, there could be many other strategies globally that would be more cost effective. And I think water utilities can tap into that. But largely, it'll be driven by, I think, policy from within the water utilities themselves, rather than central government or legislation. Thanks, thanks, David. And I'll just briefly, I think, to finish up, um, go around to everyone. Um, well, just just first, I think the interesting thing around the nitrogen cycle is that these nitrous oxide emissions um, emitted in wastewater treatment because of the the protein and the nitrogens we ingest and we excrete, and we also put a lot of nitro, you know, nitrogen-based fertilizers on the agriculture that supports the food system that we um, that we rapidly need to change for you know in response to the climate crisis as well. So when we think about recovering, trying to close that nitrogen loop, I think there's some really interesting implications that go much broader than the national inventory, you know, the waste sector, which is obviously where our emissions fall. But um, and we do see utilities who are progressive trying to trying to work around that. But just in a in a few a few seconds each, I guess, what excites you most about nitrous oxide? What keeps you going each day? Um, I'm going to start with you. Oh, well, you, I was okay, David. You can start. What what excites you? What 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 excites you? In oh, a few look, words, just, why are you just, still here? Why why are you here um, late well, in the evening? Well, 20, 20 years ago, I stood up at a conference and I spoke about nitrous oxide, and I got no questions, and there was little interest at all. The exciting thing that excites me is that there's a growing, a tremendous swell of interest, and that's how the world's climate crisis is going to be 
solved, albeit a tiny level here. It's the enthusiasm and people coming to the party. Thanks, David. Nuria? Absolutely agree. Um, I think the level of awareness uh, in my very short career, I've seen that change enormously. Uh, and I think utilities now, I think um, I agree, but I also think there's place for bottom up approach uh, for this. And I think um, our customers demand of us that we're responsible in um, I think we've seen that and now we see utilities pushing technology providers and um, regulators as well. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think there's 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 uh, there's so many utilities interested in this and, and it's a very, very odd now that you um, are attending a conference and there's a new technology and and who's not who's not showing data on n2o and there's not a question what about the n2o so i'm very very excited that n2o is going to become just a, just a natural part of the nitrogen cycle in the wastewater treatment plants just like ammonia nitrate and nitrite are um and we're going to have it present every time we make a decision it's not going to be cost and and effluent and so on and tool is going to be part of the decision. It should never be the primary goal. I think our primary goal is to is a, is a clean effluent. Um, and some utilities might better spend their money saving energy or producing energy. But I think N2O should always be uh, part of the equation. Thanks, Maria. And very quick, very quickly, um, we'll go to Jose. Okay. Well, likewise, I'm, I'm excited that. The, the interest is, is finally growing, um, but I'm also excited that we can actually do something about it now. Uh, I think in terms of monitoring, we have excellent instruments, uh, knowledge for doing monitoring, uh, in terms of identifying uh, control strategies using the data, we have good, good technology to do that. And I think uh, we have a lot of process knowledge. So. There's really no reason uh, we can't leverage each of these things to start taking action today. And uh, I think what's interesting, if you look at the at the iPhone, the first iPhone that came out um, is is terrible compared to the current one. Um, so obviously we're not perfect right now, but we can certainly make a difference. We can certainly take action. And we shouldn't wait until we have everything perfect to get started. Thanks, Jose. Mikael, and then final word to Lou, and we've overrun, which is my apologies. Mikael? For me, I, I think actually that monitoring spawns a lot of kickback in terms of process understanding, in terms of actually using uh, the, the assets that we have in the water cycle already, and then actually being able to improve them, but now in a more sustainable way. So I think in a, in a bigger scale, uh, then monitoring actually leads to a, a lot of other, both commercial, but also societal uh, benefits that, uh, that, that, that I, I enjoy see spawn now with the, uh, you know, engineering companies around the world also being interested in, in nitrous oxide now. Uh, that That is new five years ago, that was, uh, not the case. Thanks, Mikael. Leo? Yeah. Um, so I think climate change, that's a responsibility, uh, should be shared by every um, industry, by every sector. Although we are not the biggest CO2 or carbon contributor, but um, indeed wastewater contribute a lot of N2O. And N2O is not a, a greenhouse gas that can be backed, absorbed back in the carbon cycle. Once they emit it in the atmospheric, they are there. And also wastewater, um, we are very, we are highly engineered industry. So human designed this process, and then this is the place that we should have opportunity to reduce it. So it's much easier compared with other sectors, I think. Um, so I think that's a responsibility for us. And then um, also as a scientist, I have the passion to also dig into more fundamentals to understand how exactly bacteria produce this. 
Thanks. And with that, apologies, we've run over around five minutes. I hope you'll agree it was a really interesting discussion. A huge thank you to the panel for dialing in from all around the world. Um, feel we will answer questions that we didn't get to. Um, and please, um, yeah, please reach out and get in touch. And um, I'll uh, enjoy the rest of your day and I'll, I'll close the webinar now. Thank you again for joining and thank you very much to, to all you on thank the panel. You, it's been thank you, Amanda. A real privilege. Thank you, thank thank you. Thank you Amanda, as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.